evening. All you need is a pen and paper, and in the next 45 minutes, hopefully, you can do something to help solve some of Britain's most dramatic crimes. These are some of the faces, and we'll be telling you what they've done and why they're wanted. And these are some of the scenes we'll be recreating in the hope that you can help. And these are some of Britain's most senior detectives waiting for your call. In the last eight months, there have been two appalling linked rapes in South London. In fact, Detective Chief Inspector Sue Hill says she's never known victims who have been so terrorised. In each case, women were stalked. In each, the rapist seemed at first respectable and reassuring. And each seemed to start out as a robbery. Because of the intensity of fear this man has generated, tonight we hope the whole community will join forces to identify the attacker and have him brought to justice. It starts in Streatham, in South London. It's four weeks ago, early in the morning of Thursday, April the 23rd. I was going to work, but then leaving early and going to my parents. I always have a fear that I've left the most important thing that I need behind. So it's sort of like, it's panicking in a way that you're going to forget something, but also knowing that you have to get everything so it looks nice when you come back. Good morning. Good morning. But he's like he was supposed to be there. I got the impression he was getting ready to go to work. A businessman sort of dress and like the way he opened the door is what you'd expect him to do for the way he looked. My main thought was um, it's going to be a long journey with two heavy bags on the train. He, he gently pushed me back in. My initial thought was he was looking out for me to stop me seeing something I shouldn't see. It was, it was sort of like he was protecting me. The next thing I know, he put his hand over my mouth, or so was um, the knife. My head just felt like it was going to burst. It's, it's like there's so much going on, you just can't take it all in. It's something that it's, it's bigger than being scared. Now, normally we wouldn't show anything beyond that point, but you need to see the man's behaviour patterns. This is someone who can seem calm, controlled, and yet at times utterly menacing. I want the money. I, I always judge people by their eyes. That's all I've got. I've only got ten, ten pounds. I want the cards. Uh, uh, look, you, you've never seen before, so because you've never seen it, you know it's real. I need the pin numbers. I only know one of them. Where are they? In those papers. The most important thing was that I had to get through. I had to be OK. Yeah. Get me a pen. I sort of looked for things that were little things that would catch the eye. Everything about what he was wearing was I immaculate. He, he was tall, over six foot. He was wide. Didn't look fat. He, he just, he was a wide person. He's very quietly spoken, but he could put force into his voice without raising it. It's very, very controlled. And his eyes became angry, like very angry. Well, I'd, I've not seen evil before, but you just know it when you see it. Within minutes of the attack, the victim's credit card was used at the Midland Bank on Streatham Hill. A few minutes later, and it was tried in Streatham High Road. And soon afterwards, in Tooting. This is a distant image, but the man you can see has got a car. 
Here he is from another camera in Tooting. Again, not a brilliant image, but do you know him? Remember his white car? It's got a sunroof. And is it missing its front near side wheel trim? Late that night, the card was used in Oxford Street in London's West End. And over the next few days, back around Tooting. So, Hill, this caused such fear. Do you think that there will be other victims who've been too frightened to report it? I'm sure that's the case, Nick. You know, these two victims are terrified to come forward. And if they are listening, please make that call to us. We can help you. You know, don't live with this. Um, these two victims have come forward and, and they've been supported. Please do the same. What about girlfriends? I mean, assuming that he has relationships, ordinary relationships, will they have seen something of these behaviour patterns? I'm sure there'd be aspects of his behaviour, but conversely, he could be someone that behaves very rationally and very normal and be carrying out a, a full-time job, and you, know, you may not suspect him of committing any such offences as this. People be very reluctant to shop somebody, particularly somebody they're intimate with. But it, I must you know, make the point that we've got forensic evidence, so you won't be accusing the wrong man. We can eliminate any suspects that you put forward, and it won't be accusing the wrong person. What can you add in terms of the man's appearance and, and, and mannerism, just to make that jigsaw piece puzzle the pieces fit? We know he's about six foot. Uh, his complexion is very dark black. And these glasses? And the glasses, but of course the glasses could be disguised, although he may need those glasses, so don't be thrown by, by those glasses. But it's a good, very good description. How important is the car? Well, it is important, but then again, we must remember that he could have borrowed, stolen. He may not normally be associated with a white car, but if you know, you know somebody that's driving that white car, then you know, call us. Tell us a bit about what happened in the first of these attacks, which was in August last year. We also in Streatham. Well, yes. Um, we know the same man is responsible for those, both these attacks. Again, victim terrified, about to go into her own home, uh, and she was also robbed of, of a cash point card. But this time, one of the cash point cards was used in Hammersmith in West London, which mm. is quite a, quite a way away. Yeah, I must make the point that that was some time after the rape, in the early hours of the following morning. So that man um, may not be the rapist, but he certainly may know who the rapist is. Conversely, maybe someone who's just using the, call, uh, the card um, to, uh, for deception. And um, I would appeal to him, come forward, talk to me. There's a difference between us tracing you for um, a series of rapes and, and that for deception. You describe this as one of the most frightening crimes for, for victims. Mm. You've, you've talked a lot extensively to the victims, haven't you? I have. They're both traumatised. And more importantly, I've also spoken to the parents of our latest victim. They're absolutely gutted. Please, if you know who's done this, call us. If it was your daughter, they'd be picking up the phone and doing that for you. I see, thank you. I mean, all Crime Watch appeals are aimed at everyone, regardless of age or race or sex. But this next clip is perhaps aimed principally at women. Women who have suspicions about him, who, about who did this, but women who are reluctant to believe it or to ring in. This is it now. This is the most I can do. I've given all the information, but maybe somebody else will know something that I don't know. I can't... <sighs> it's difficult to put it into words how, how strongly I feel about catching him. Please call right now or any time till midnight, and it's a free call, 0500 600 600, or try the incident room on 0181 649 266. That's 0181 649 266. There have been five arrests since last month's programme. Several key witnesses have been identified, and there's a lot of progress that may soon lead to more arrests. The hunt for a bogus policeman in Newport in North Wales created 200 new lines of inquiry, including 70 names, and three of those came up twice. Have you any £20 notes? Yes. Could I see one, please? On the tragic murders in Sussex of Dorney O'Connor and her neighbour Claire Letchford, detectives are working through a mountain of information, and a dozen names are now being looked at seriously. And over 100 calls on the armed robbery at a jeweller's shop in Warwick, but this stage it doesn't look as though the crucial information is there. But one man we were seeking has been sighted on the Costa del Sol in southern Spain. Acting on a tip-off, Spanish police opened fire on a car at Malaga airport but the vehicle sped off. Now if you've seen this man, Mark Henderson, do let us know on 0500 600 600. Train stations have installed some very good closed-circuit TV systems and in the drive to cut crime on the railway system they're getting some great results. 
Last month, these three youths were hanging around Wilson Junction and Stonebridge Park stations in North London. They look as though they know each other pretty well. The one with the Adidas sweatshirt spots a potential victim, produces a knife and robs a terrified fellow traveller. Just look at the clarity of these pictures. First, the bystanders. This man with the white Nike top is 18 to 20 and about 6 foot tall. His friend is also about 20, shorter at 5 foot 8. The knife man looks charming in this picture. It could almost be a family photo. He's 18 to 20 and roughly 5 foot 10. Please tell us who they are. 0500 600 600 or contact British Transport Police on 0171 387 0354. That's 0171 387 0354. Now another man to keep away from. See if you know who this gunman is. Listen carefully. Oh. The man who went off empty-handed is in his 20s, about 5 foot 8, thin, and appears to have lost some of his top teeth. His baseball cap had the word Athos, that's A-T-H-O-S. Give us a call if you know him on 0500 600 600 or phone the Flying Squad on 0181 247 7931. That's 0181 247 7931. Now, think back if you can to just before Christmas, Friday the 19th of December. It was a busy shopping day all across Britain. But in Queensbury, on the outskirts of Bradford, the seasonal bustle and goodwill was dramatically interrupted. What happened that morning was literally murderous. Pen on you. I'll nip up to the office. My dad's a fit man, he's never been poor. Very active, outgoing, enjoyed his, uh, his work really. Since became a security man, that's all it was work. Actually, he, he did too much work, so it like took over his life really. Behind the Yorkshire Bank in Queensbury is a dead-end alley known as Cambridge Place. On that Friday morning, a local trader saw a stranger there. The man was heavily built, mid-thirties, bald on top with black hair at the sides. The witness was suspicious, but the visitor quickly disappeared. Who was he? And was he connected with what happened about five minutes later? Queensbury is a, a nice little village rural village. Ordinary people going about their ordinary business. I was going to deposit some money in the bank in the high street. My Sarah's Lucy is really into Barbie at the moment. She's obsessed. I'd love to get her one for Christmas. It's one of them little houses with all the gear that goes with it, but what with all to the grandchildren. There's no need to rush, but we can put another 20 minutes or so, yeah, yeah is that? Yeah. We thought, right, December the 19th, we'll get out to the bank, buy a Christmas present and get everything done and then go to work as normal. Yorkshire Bank. I saw this robber. I didn't think it was real at first. I thought somebody were filming. No! 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 I'd say he was more chubby than athletic and stocky. He had a pitted face as though he'd had acne or something. It seemed local, the way he was speaking. When shot or fired, I didn't think it was real. I didn't think twice. I just knew that he had to be stopped. If he had a turnaround, then I'd have run him over. 
The robber jumped into Fountain Mews and was heard heading for the Brighouse and Denholm Road. Did you see where he went next? All right, man. He was in a hell of a lot of pain. A bullet went straight in his chest, fractions away from his heart. I was totally on my own with him. Um, I think everyone was frightened as to what was going on. But I'm glad I was there for him. The security guard was just doing his job of work. He had no grief, no, no grief with this fella. He had no argument with him. Why the hell he had to shoot him? Why shoot him? Oh. I'm a nurse. Can I... oh. That's it, steady. Oh. Every time we went in to see him in intensive care, you were like reliving it every day. You were all right after you'd been in, but um, when you first went in, you just went through it again every time. That's when you can't believe that somebody's done it. I think we could have caught better if it had been an illness. Don't worry, there'll be here soon, listen. Here. Well, Stuart Hyde, the guard, was very lucky to get away with his life, wasn't he? He certainly was. These were near-fatal injuries that this man received. It nearly killed him. He has, however, made a, a very remarkable recovery, but that shouldn't take away from the fact that he is still suffering some six months later from this shooting. Now, you had a very good description of the attacker, didn't you, from various witnesses? That's correct. We've had an excellent EFIT done of this offender. He's described as well-built, six foot tall, about 30 years old, but he's got a rather peculiar pockmarked face, and he was wearing a rather distinctive hat. Well, exactly. You'd certainly remember that. And what about his accent? Was he a local man, do you think? It's quite possible that this man was a local man, but not necessarily living in the area. He may have come from anywhere within the north of the country. Now, it's important to say that the reason he got away with this crime, stealing the money, was because the box malfunctioned, unusually so. And he took the money away in these bags, I think. That's correct. These are identical to the bags in which the money was stolen. And my appeal is to anyone that perhaps recognises these bags, recognises anyone from the CD fit, or perhaps can recall somebody that they knew the week before Christmas in 1987 who suddenly had a great deal of extra cash. Now there is a, a reward involved here as if an incentive was needed, wasn't there? There certainly is. The security company themselves have put up up to £15,000 reward money to help me put this man behind bars. Well, let's hope you get him tonight. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart Hyde. Well, here are the numbers. 0500 600 600 is the free call straight here to the studio. And the incident room, if you prefer to call there, in Bradford is on 01274 376 911. That's Bradford 376 911. There's been a breakthrough on the murder of Patrick Hurling case we've featured twice now, once back in 1991 and again in Crime Watch Still Unsolved early last December. Oh, damn it, I think somebody's broken in the car. Hurling? Girl, love, get in the car. Won't be long. I wasn't concerned at the time because Pat knew so many people. It could have been a colleague, um, somebody knew from the the nightclub, it could have been anybody. Who was this man, a quarter to 12 on a Saturday night in November 1990? As a direct result of us revisiting that crime five months ago, some startling new information came to light and the inquiry took what was called a very promising new turn. We'll tell you more when we can, but if you're able to add anything more to that inquiry, call us here now on 0500 600 600. Well, uh, shortly uh, into the programme, we haven't had many cases yet, but so far, 42 calls on the rapes in, uh, in Streatham. Eight names have been put forward. One caller has mentioned an ex-boyfriend. Um, on the Stonebridge Park crime, we've had four calls on that so far. Slowly other calls filtering in, and our detectives and researchers are busy, as you can see, so hopefully we'll have some more to tell you by the end of the programme. 
And now an interesting video. It's a man who's wanted by police for questioning about an armed robbery. But the tape in which he's featured in is, believe it or not, a crime prevention video. He's warning young people not to get involved in crime. Philip Cagill is tall, he's medium built, he's 35 with a Durham accent. So if you know where he is, 0500 600 600 or call Humberside Police on 01482 856 556. That's Hull 856 556. Our next case has no violence, but it resulted in serious financial loss for one of the victims and real emotional trauma for all of them. It's a series of crimes that happened over a five-week period, though it may still be continuing. Landlords, estate agents and antique dealers, beware. I was in hospital and literally just recovering from the anaesthetic when I was called and it was my housekeeper telling me that the house had been stripped bare. Oh, Christ. An awful lot of things had been taken of great sentimental value that I'd recently inherited from my parents who have died in the past year. Between February and March, estate agents around the country showed a smart young man round properties to rent. Oh, the, um, the cleaner comes every day, but she won't bother you here if you don't want her to. No, I prefer if she didn't. Right, yeah. okay. Good. No, this is fine. This is just what I'm looking for. The owners of the properties were mostly uninsured. It's, lovely. it's the little things that really matter so desperately to me and that I'm missing still, you know. There are, they've left, although they're small in size, they've left huge holes behind in my life. And how much is this one? Well, with the connection pack, it will be £430. Well, I'm going to pay cash, so how about £400? OK, £400 cash. OK, I'll take it. He was particularly memorable. His hair was sort of flicked back in a, a 1950s pop star style image. He was wearing an overcoat uh, across his shoulders and he hadn't got his arms through the sleeves, rather like a, a Hollywood film producer. Do you want a receipt for this, no, sir? that's fine. Okay. Thank you. OK, thanks. Hi, Hello. William Blind, Surgeon. Great, hang on, let me just get the keys. Here we are. You're early, you haven't been waiting for long, have you? No, it's all right. Had Good. a coffee. It's OK, let's go. Where are you from? Well, London originally, but I've been living in Italy for the last seven years or so. Oh. Yes, I'm staying at Blake's Hotel at the moment. So, here we are. He was really pleasant. He was healthy, uh, well-dressed, and he had a public school accent. No, this is just what I'm looking for. Hmm. Everything's plugged in and working in the kitchen. Good. Good. Well, this will be fine. Uh, well, a 10% deposit, will that be all right? Yeah. OK, that's £250. 250 Good. Now, uh, will it be all right if I bring my uncle round? Yeah, sure, that shouldn't be a problem. Good. OK, I'll make you out a receipt for this. Lovely. And I'll show you the way out. Thank you. Thank you. This will be good. What do you think? I think he's right. Hmm? I won't be able to manage those stairs. Oh, come on, it seems all right to me. But if we don't take it now, I'll lose my deposit. You should have thought about that. Oh, well, it's there just is, not right. There is a downstairs bedroom. If you want to have a look through there. Okay. The agent thought that disagreement was contrived. Who was the so-called uncle? In his 60s, five foot nine, dressed smartly in navy sports jacket and paisley cravat. Well. Maybe you'd like a couple of minutes to think about it. Well, thank you. Yeah. I don't know what the problem is. Well, there was a woman sitting in the back of the Volvo. She was in her 50s. Uh, she had waved shoulder length brown hair and she was wearing quite a lot of makeup. It's 
take my app this way. Okay, good. Hello, how can I help? Hi, it's Mr. Blythe Sinjin here. Hello. Hello. Look, I'm ringing because I want to rent the cottage for another week. I'll have to check with the owner, but it shouldn't be a problem. Um, I'll need you to come in and sign the agreement. Well, I'll come in later today. Bye. Later that morning, a local man was driving past the cottage and found the road blocked. They were two youngish men, I would have said middle twenties. Um, quite slim build and they had quite hard faces. They weren't the sort of people I felt that I would want to go up and talk to. I was still waiting for him to come into the office and sign the agreement and pay the extra week of rent. But when I drove past, the lights were on and everything seemed okay. By the Tuesday, I still hadn't heard from him, so I went up to the cottage again. I saw that the place had been cleared. Everything was gone. I just couldn't believe it. My wife loves this house. So when she saw it empty, I mean, she, she just, uh, she got on the phone, she was hysterical. And she said, everything's gone. Everything's gone. I said, I, could, I can't believe it. What do you mean everything's gone? Yeah, they've taken all the furniture. I said, it's impossible. So it's quite a good size, isn't it? Mm, yeah, nice. Mm. And three bedrooms in all, so there's plenty of room. Right. Yes, it's, uh, it's quite traditional, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So do let me know as soon as you can, because we've had quite a lot of interest. Right. I'm showing several people around later in the week. Uh-huh. Here's my card. He asked me for a lift to World's End on the King's Road, but when we were nearly there, he asked me to drop him off a bit further down on the corner of Lots Road. All right, thanks for the lift. I'll be in touch soon. I'd say he was between about 25 and 28. He was an average build. He was tanned, he was clean-shaven, he had massy brown hair that was swept off his forehead. Two months ago, at about noon, on Thursday, March the 19th, a black cab brought a so-called Mr Thorne to Princedale Road in London's Holland Park. Were you the driver? Cheers. Uh, you can just hang on here a minute. I won't be long. Right. Yeah, all right. Have Cheers, mate. I have decided I want to take the flat. OK, great. If you'd like to have a seat. Good. Right. Do you have to sign a form? Uh, yes, I'll just draw up a tenancy agreement. It's Mr... Thorne. Without the E. That's a balance of £3,000 to pay, please. Right. How would you like to settle that? Cash. He gave me all the money in cash in £20 notes, and I remember noticing it was in bundles of £100. Hold the one of these to Now, uh, when can I pick up the keys? We'll have them ready for you first thing tomorrow morning. Great. Well, I'll see you then. OK. OK, thanks. The following Monday, March the 23rd, neighbours complained of noise coming from the flat. Was a party being held there? Or was the music covering the noise of moving furniture? Take a look at the con man. He's in his 20s, 5 foot 10, with fair hair swept back off his forehead and with what was described, as you heard, as a public school accent. And look again at distinctive features of his clothing. That light brown overcoat might actually have had a fur or darker collar. He also wore a brown shot bomber jacket and a pair of black framed stuzzy glasses. He likes designer clothes. The older man was about five foot nine, between 60 and 70, with a well-spoken but croaky voice and described as unsteady on his feet. And who owned the vehicles? The blue M-registered Volvo and, in another case, they used a red Ford Fiesta. Then there were the two vans used for the thefts, one white and one blue. 
Now, among the items stolen, some were particularly distinctive. This pair of West African ivory tusks mounted in silver, a pair of gilt bronze French candlesticks, and look at this oak chair. If you recognize any of that, if you can help in any way, 0500 600 600, or you can call the incident room direct on 0181 246 0368. That's 0181 246 0368. I've got two disappearing acts, and in both cases, a lot of money vanished too. On New Year's Day, the manager of a sports store went to work even though the store was closed. He unlocked the premises in St John's Shopping Centre in the heart of Liverpool, and here he is soon afterwards leaving with a large sports bag. His employers haven't seen him since, and a lot of money has vanished too. Have you seen him? Graham Stanley is in his early 30s, 5 foot 9, stocky build with dark hair. He might have gone abroad for a time, but someone thought they caught sight of him quite close to home last month at the Grand National of Aintree, and he may have been in Dublin. If you've seen him, do call us on 0500 600 600 or call the incident room direct on 0151 777 4051. That's Liverpool, 777 4051. Now, from New Year's Day to the Chinese New Year. This is the kitchen of a Chinese takeaway in Fullborn on the outskirts of Cambridge. The cook had just been taken on here, but after a week in the job, he failed to turn up for work. He left some clothes in the flat above, but there seemed to have been a burglary. Quite a lot of cash was missing too. You may have seen this man in other Chinese restaurants or in betting shops. He's six foot, muscular, and in his early 20s. If you can tell us who he is and where he is, do call 0500 600 600 or call the Cambridge Police Direct on 01223 358 966. That's Cambridge 358 966. Next, we're going to show you something that happened last October. It's a street crime in Highbury, North London, and its target was a young family. Ricky Smith, his partner Anita, and their children Michaela and Paul. Ricky was a flooring contractor working with his father. On Friday night, October the 3rd, he'd just been paid for a job they'd completed, and his dad dropped him back home. I had a job at Holloway paid up today, 600 quid. So how much do I owe you for that seal? Uh, 50 quid. Uh, there's, uh, there's 560 there. You take it out of that and put the rest aside. You're going to be in that house by Christmas, it is, right? Yeah, I hope so. Oh, don't forget, early start in the morning. So don't go stopping out late tonight. Right? Alright. See you in the morning. See ya. All right, love. There you go. Treat yourself. Where's that come from? Oh, I just got paid. Hey, do you uh, want to go down to the pub later tonight? We haven't got a babysitter. Well, I'll call Chanel ask her to come over. All right. What everyone used to say, Ricky was like an um, old-fashioned man. He said we'd get married when we were about 30. And he was just a really good father. He just believed that if you have children, you stay with them. And Ricky wanted to buy a nurse so we could bring the kids up somewhere decent. Alright. Alright. Have a brown eco, please. Done yourself out, yeah? Yeah, well, there's a couple we haven't looked at. Oh, yeah? What around here? Yeah, Holloway, we're looking for. Good stuff, good stuff. How many rooms are you looking for? What, three. What about a garden? It'd be nice, but... Well, yeah, a garden. Yeah, well, it'd be very nice, but it depends how it goes, you know. Yeah? All that comes up. Time, ladies and gentlemen, please. Right, where are we going next, then? Home. Happy saving, remember? And you've got to be up early in the morning. Yeah, all right. Yeah, come on, then. Come on. At 11.30 that Friday night, a woman was heading home down Highbury Park towards Blackstock Road. 
But I noticed him first of all because he was just standing in such a strange way in the phone box and also he looked, he looked like he was definitely trying to hide his face away from me. He was about six foot tall. He was quite well built, but I just couldn't see his face. Hello, police. I've just seen a man get attacked. I'm following the bloke who did it. He's running up Highbury Grove. He was jogging away quite casually, and that sort of caught my attention because it was very strange. He didn't seem to be sprinting away or anything like that. But I still followed him, and um, he cut across into Albert Park, at which point I had to turn my car around, and he just just seemed to disappear. I, I couldn't find him after that. I've just lost him. He's run down one of the streets. Just something I never expected in my life. Help! My mind went blank. I can't believe it. I always thought it'd be here. The attacker ran from Highbury Grove down Avenel Road next to the Arsenal football ground, then down Conewood Street. He was last seen running back into Blackstock Road. We got a phone call and um, we both dashed out. He was in the ambulance being worked on, but he was. Um, they said you can't see him in the ambulance because he was, he was pretty bad. Red stripes on his jacket. Uh, IC code unknown, over. For someone to just come up, creep up and do that, it's, it's madness. It's destroyed us. Destroyed Paul's future, Michaela's future, Nia's future, ours. It's, it's ruined everything. And it's all been for no reason. It's been done for nothing. Someone's gone and murdered him for nothing. Is that yours? No. That's strange. Oh, hang on here. I'll just go and get a torch. It seems to be some sort of clothing. What's that all about, then? Have you found the bag? Yeah, we gave it to the police last night. Only when I was walking home last night, I saw someone throw it over your wall. Do you know what was in it? Well, there was a cap and a jacket. It's to do with that stabbing up the road. All right. Cheers. I remember he was well-spoken and he was in his mid to late twenties, about five foot seven tall, and he was carrying a um, black and grey rucksack. What a dreadful crime. Chris, what, do you think that man could have been the killer? I don't believe he was the attacker. He may have been an accomplice. If he wasn't, he's a man I need to see because he's an important witness and I need to speak to him. Now, what most people sitting at home watching tonight's programme are probably thinking is why it seemed to be apparently motiveless. From the inquiries that I've made and the investigations that I've conducted, it does appear at the present time to be totally motiveless. But do you think that perhaps Ricky had something in his life that perhaps had provoked a revenge attack in some way? That might have happened, but I don't know. I'd ask people, if they do know, to come and speak to me. Anything about Ricky's life yes, that might be of interest. Um, now, what do you know about the man who committed the crime? I can give you a description. He's a coloured male. He's five foot, five, six foot tall, 18 to 30 years old. Which isn't particularly helpful, is it, really? <laughs> no, but linked with the clothing, it might help. Yes, well, tell us a bit more about the clothing here. The attacker was wearing a dark blue Chicago Bulls jacket with mm. red and white stripes with a distinctive picture of a bull on it. Mm. The cap was a dark blue Reebok cap 
Mm -hmm. And it was put in these carry bags. Now, the Brent Cross Fenix is a very common one in that area, Indeed. but the one that interests you as well is the other, other green one. Yes, the green one is a Wilkie's carrier bag, which is a Scottish retailer's, and as far as I'm aware, only retails in Scotland. Now, why do you think that he, he dumped them in Conewood Street that night? He may well have panicked in his attempt to escape, and that was a place that he could hide them and perhaps come back later and retrieve them. Now, an event that might jog people's memory is the fact that it was the eve of the Arsenal home game against Barnsley. That That's night? correct, yes, indeed. So it's Friday the 3rd of October. Now, you've got some important clues here, but what about the knife that he used? Have you recovered that? I've now recovered the knife, and that's an 8.5-inch long lock knife with a 3.5-inch blade. On it is a price tag. Now, the price tag reads 9.95. Now, again, we've had a number of cases tonight in which there are rewards. There's a, re a reward here, isn't there's there? There's a substantial reward of £10,000 in this case upon conviction. Thank you very much, thank you. Crystal. Thank you. Well, Ricky left behind a partner, two young children, a tragic, tragic crime. 0500 600 600. If you've heard anything, please call us right away. And other detectives are waiting for you right now as well on 0181 733 6283. That's 0181 733 6283. Now think back three months to Valentine's Day, February the 14th. It's around nine in the evening and there's a very unromantic interlude at an off-licence in Hemel Hempstead, Hertfordshire. This man has been hanging round the store for ages and it seems to be digging in his pocket for money to pay for a bar of chocolate. But instead of accepting his change, he now comes out with a knife and jumps over the counter. These are good images. He's five foot eight, late teens or early twenties, with skin, skinny with stubble, a gaunt face and rather scruffy. If you can identify him, do let us know, 0500 600 600, or call the incident room direct on 01442 271000. That's Hemel Hempstead, 271000. In early April, Roxana Nas, a 19-year-old, was reported missing from her home in Derby. Her body was later discovered in a field in West Yorkshire. Since then, detectives have been trying to trace the dead girl's older brother. He's Shazad Ali Nas, 21, slim and fairly short at 5 foot 3. He was seen about a month ago in a silver Vauxhall Cavalier Commander, registration C104FCP. If you've seen it or him, please ring Derbyshire Police Direct on 01332290666. That's Derby 290666. Or you can call us now on 0500 600 600. Let me tell you very quickly about some of the calls we've had so far. On the Pat Hurling murder, our reappeal, somebody's rung in who's very close to the victim with some new information for the police, which looks very encouraging indeed. On the house clearance theft, we may have found the taxi driver in London's Notting Hill. Uh, a caller rang and gave a name for the older man and we're rather keen for that anonymous caller to ring again we promise him his name will not be divulged to anybody on the streatham rates fantastic information coming in and keep calling our lines are open here in the studio we'll be taking calls until midnight and you'll see other numbers in a moment they're also listed on cfax on page 621 now if you're on the internet our website is www.bbc.co.uk UK slash Crime Watch and all information on appeals will be sent on to the police. If you've any information on any crime, in fact, try Crime Stoppers. You can call anonymously on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. We'll have more news in Crime Watch update at 10 past 11, rather earlier than usual. And the date for Crime Watch next month is Tuesday, June the 16th. But before then, watch out for a powerful film which shows how Crime Watch viewers helped to solve one of the crimes that people felt especially keen to solve. The most traumatic shock, not just to me, but to all of us, the only time I've ever seen injuries approaching the gravity of these particular ones have been on people who were dead. Crime Watch File is here on BBC One next Tuesday night at 20 past 10. And meanwhile, I know we show some deeply unpleasant crimes, not least that scene. But as you'll see in Crime Watch File, these things also bring out the very best in people. Now, after all, if you think about it, millions of people watching now are just there anxious to help. So don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>